We are going to get started. And, uh, we're going to start with our uh, psalm and a prayer and a little bit of a hymn. So I can't see unless I go back here. Yeah. We'll speak this uh, responsibly. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tents. He will lift me high upon a rock. We pray together. O Lord, Lord our God, we thank you for your great goodness toward us. We praise you for the mercy and grace you give us through your Son, Jesus. Bless the teaching of your word. Open our hearts and minds to hear you. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of verses of this. Semi over and done. Somebody left this um, notebook here, and they were taking um, wonderful notes. I don't know if they have any relation to what I was saying. <laughs> Uh, but if this belongs to anybody, October 8th is the bulletin. My guess was with the Southwestern team that it belonged to Sandy, but she says it's not. Um, um, I think I know. I can't remember the names. New members. Okay. Well, we will leave it here. And uh, if anybody wants to join it, uh, they may. Um, so uh, today is the last day that. Uh, Today's the end of the end times. So, um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, let's meet Jesus soon. <laughs> 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 
willing, we won't have class next week. So God willing, we won't have class next week. Well, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah. We will see about that. <laughs> we could just go on indefinitely and say no one knows the day, neither the people know. Well, there's a lot, a lot about it now about the day. Mm -hmm. So uh, next week we'll begin a new class uh, on the book of Jonah. We'll do that for about six weeks, if God willing. Um, if Jonah has six weeks of uh, information for us, but here's the question: <laughs> the fish judgment or salvation? Well, that's why we're studying Jonah. We're gonna we'll deal with that question, Paul. An excellent question. Um, that's my suggestion. Uh, and we will. Uh, we will talk about. It. <coughs> Welcome. Oh. So, uh, what we're going to do today uh, is deal, uh, we've, we've kind of uh, flitted around this topic, and that is uh, the main uh, sort of um, competitor, if you will, to the classic teaching of, uh, to what the Bible teaches about the end times, and traditional understanding is something called dispensational premillennialism, otherwise known as left behind, the rapture, uh, and so forth. And we've talked about it a little bit, but we're going to go through, uh, um, you know, the nuts and bolts of what it teaches, where it came from, uh, sort of a Lutheran evaluation of this. And uh, if it takes us 50 minutes, so be it. Uh, if not, we'll just talk about what any questions or anything you have uh, left over from what we've done or uh, anything pertaining to eschatology or the end times that you that you have any questions about? I always take that as a vindication of my excellent uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, so um, dispensational premillennialism uh, began um, with this fellow, it's a very useful picture of him. His name was John Nelson Darby, and uh, he was a, a member of a, a group in England uh, called the Plymouth Brethren, uh, which was a low church, uh, free church offshoot of Anglicanism. And um, basically, uh, John Nelson Darby uh, came up with the idea of dispensationalism uh, and then merged it with premillennialism in, in, in sort of a novel way. But um, it, I think, I don't remember the dates of when he started to uh, publicize this, but in 1820s, 1840s. Um, mm. So as a sort of theological system or um, idea, it's quite recent. I mean, for us, it might seem old, 18 you know, 200 years, you know, 1820. But in the overall scope of the church's history, uh, quite a novelty, right? Um, I mean, uh, for 2,000 years, nobody had ever sort of interpreted the Bible in this way. Um, so, I can't see this screen, which is really irritating to me. Uh, I can't see it. Uh, Darby uh, developed an understanding of history as a period of seven dispensations. We'll, we mentioned that already. Uh, this is really, uh, and we'll talk about it more, what those dispensations were, 200 years. Uh, the next big guy uh, in the popularization of uh, left behind theology was C.I. Schofield. Any of you ever have a Schofield reference Bible? Here, kid. I have one. I should have brought it. Uh, I have one on my shelf. Uh, it was. Uh, it came out in the middle, uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, if you know, there was a big uh, fight. Um, you know, fundamentalism was gaining uh, strength versus uh, liberalism. Uh, is the Bible true? Evolution? Are there such a thing as miracles? 
um, supernatural. All of that was going on in the early 1900s, uh, the, the Scopes trial, all that sort of thing. And fundamentalism was a, a reaction to Charles Darwin and this reinterpretation of scripture as being just a, a human word, not a divine word. And uh, um, Schofield uh, was a fundamentalist, and this Bible was a helpful study Bible sort of for them, sort of like our Lutheran study Bible, but it had embedded in it this idea of dispensations and dispensational premillennialism. And it became very popular and spread these ideas uh, throughout America, especially in evangelicalism, fundamentalism, right? Um, and there became an, an assumption in, in fundamentalism and in the evangelical camp that this dispensationalism was really the only true, uh, accurate way of interpreting the Bible. So there's an assumption that the understanding of the end times in this way, rapture, tribulation, uh, literal millennium, was the really the only correct way of understanding them. It just it kind of got embedded uh, in that in that culture. Literalism, one of the big, as we'll see, one of the big um, features of uh, dispensational premillennialism was uh, a literal reading of the Bible, uh, which in many ways is 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 correct laudable and we would agree and, and we talked about this briefly but when you, when you get into the book of Revelation and some other parts to read them literally kind of uh, mm. um, get you into trouble and it's also a flat way of reading scripture we talked about this also so this morning in church we will have an Old Testament reading uh, we'll have a psalm or a gradual of some kind these are very detailed drawings of these things. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have an epistle lesson. And then what will happen? Before we have the epistle lesson, what will we do? Hallelujah. We will sing the Alleluia and we will stand up. For what? Gospel. For the gospel reading. Uh, and this is a, a way in worship of, 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 a, of a not so flat reading of scripture. In other words, dispensationalism says you know, this promise to Abraham here in the Old Testament and this verse about Jesus and the book of Revelation and all of this, it's all flat, right? This gets as much weight as this, gets as much weight as this, gets as much weight as this. Uh, Christians have always, you know, this isn't so helpful, have always said the entire scripture uh, revolves around Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And one way we acknowledge that in worship is, of course, the Old Testament is the Word of God, and the Epistle is as well. But the Gospel, right, um, uh, the proclamation of what Jesus has done, is central. Right? And so, it's not only the dispensationals who read Scripture in a literal way, um, but also in a in a flat way, um, which leads into all sorts of problems. So that affects then, presumably, the interpretation of Scripture. Some. And yes. we have scripture interpret scripture. Right, right. So, which, so we which do. Which ones yes. refer to which, you know, that the gospel. What's that? Well, of which one, if there's multiple references, sort of, obviously the gospel is probably the most clearest. Right. And should explain things the best. Right. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, scripture interpret scripture. And, and we've done that before. And it's a very important, when you get into the book of Revelation, that you allow the whole of scripture to interpret what is an apocalyptic book written in a strange style and so forth and so on. But it's also important that scripture, not only scripture interprets scripture, um, but that um, uh, the gospel interprets scripture. In, in, in other words, again, the easiest illustration is that the Old Testament points to the cross you know, forward and the New Testament points to Jesus, um, not backwards, but as the central path. And that event, the atonement, um, is the central message of the scripture. If, and with the dispensationalists, um, if we say, so we read scripture, right? And when we read scripture, we have to come out with a, 
you know, a center. What's at the center? Because, you know, there's tons of biblical data here, right? And it's quite disjointed, to be honest. I mean, the book of Genesis doesn't read like the book of Revelation. The Psalms is written in one way and in one era. Paul's letters are completely different kind of literature than uh, the book of Proverbs. I mean, and, and, it's all, and it's two different languages. So you have all of this data. And so the question becomes, how do you organize that data? How do you make a consistent story out of it or a system, right? Dispensationalists say that Israel is the center. That's literally the center of the Bible, is the promises to Abraham and the nation, the physical nation of Israel in Palestine, right, in Canaan. Um, Lutherans and traditional and Christians generally have, all, have said that the center is Christ. Right? So once you say the center is Christ and not physical nation of Israel, you know, all the rest, then you have to, it's the interesting thing, right? Um, we both have the same data. We all have the same verses of the Bible and we all accept them as literally true, right? And in fact, we agree with the fundamentalists to say that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God. And so we all have the same data points, but we arrange them in a different way, right? Once you say that Christ is the center and what he has done on the cross, then these promises to Israel, they're here and they are important, but they're in there in relation to Christ, right? And here Israel becomes the center and certainly Jesus is a part of their teaching, but Jesus is over here uh, essentially pointing to Israel. So how you arrange the data is, is, is important. And I have no idea why. I mean, anyway. So um, just to, you know, sort of a, a history of how uh, this theology became so popular. In the 1970s, Hal Lindsey uh, put out a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. I remember this book. Um, I'm dating myself. Many churches began showing movies using Lindsey's predictions involving the USSR. So uh, this book came out in the early 70s, and uh, he interpreted uh, the biblical the portions of Daniel and the book of Revelation dealing with the Middle East in terms of uh, the USSR, you know, Gog and Magog, and the Battle of Armageddon, that uh, this would involve uh, the USSR invading uh, from the north into the Middle East against Israel, and the Battle of Armageddon was some sort of uh, conflagration like that. So you get, was it the Yom Kippur War in 1973, right? Uh, and all of these things that are happening um, in 1967. I, I don't know if the, the dates are, and the names of these I may have wrong. But. So those battles in the Middle East, communism, you know, uh, as a figure of the Antichrist, all of that sort of came in. Now, the wall fell, and whenever the wall fell, 1989, Soviet Union went away. So, you know, Hal Lindsey's not looking so smart anymore. Uh, uh, but in the early 1990s, uh, a new boost came from Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, who began a, a, a series of novels uh, called Left Behind, and uh, became very popular movies. Uh, the books were very effective, uh, they're not such great theology, well, I mean, and they're not theological, you know, it's not like, like I teach, <laughs> you know, it's not dispensational premillennialism, here's an outline, you know, here's this, blah, 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 I mean, they're novels, you know, stuff happens, uh, there's families, there's, you know, people in airplanes and, you know, their husbands disappear, uh, and all the rest, and so it's very effective, uh, people like to read them, they were, um, dramatic, entertaining, and so forth. And they became very uh, popular, and in fact, uh, the movies became popular too. And just to show you that I'm a multimedia entertaining character, <laughs> here's, the here's the trailer for uh, Left Behind. I don't remember, this movie came out in 1990. Kirk Cameron, I don't know, his face is familiar, but supposedly he's famous. Anyway, he's in the movie. Let's do this again. <laughs> Is everything okay? It's my husband. He, he's disappeared. 
disappeared. You know what? I bet you just slipped off to the restroom while you were asleep. Would you mind checking, please? Okay, sure. And take this. Ma'am? I think he's gone off naked. Great people are missing. Dozens of seats empty. We are at 37,000 feet. Nobody just walked off this airplane. We do not know how many have disappeared. But what we do know now is that peace is built. Ladies and gentlemen, it's official. Nikolai Karpakia will be our new Secretary General. I know where Mom and Rami are. They're in heaven with God. The rapture, the vanishings, this marks the beginning of the rise of the Antichrist. God, I've never prayed before. Just show me what to do. Watch Left Behind on Inspiration TV. Anybody seen those movies? Anybody seen that movie? Read the book. Read the book? Well, a few times. I read the book. She didn't see the movie. <laughs> I mean, it was a good book. Yeah. Right. That was it. It was a good book. Yes. Uh, I remember when they uh, came out. Uh, many people in the congregation that uh, read them, uh, for better or worse. Yeah. Very entertaining. Well, it's a good guy, bad guy. Right. 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 Um, <clears throat> I want to say there were seven novels, which would be even perfect because there are seven dispensations. I don't really remember. Yeah. So I'm just going to go through a, a list of, uh, of what dispensational premillennialism, distinctive features and emphases. As I've already said, as we've said, there's a necessity for the literal interpretation of all the prophetic portions of Scripture. So, again, um, you know, if and, and one of and here it kind of goes with this: all promises made to David and Abraham in the old covenant are to be literally fulfilled in the future millennial age. So, um, if there's a passage that says a descendant of David is going to reign uh, as king of Israel, right? Um, in this literal way of, of interpreting scripture, that means that there has to be a literal a descendant of David. Who actually reigns as a political king in the nation of Israel in Jerusalem on earth, uh, you know, in a, in a political system? He would also be, you know, obviously a, a messianic and a, and a Christian figure, but he would be a literal king in, in Israel. Um, and, and that's true of all of these uh, sort of things. Um, so, what dispensationalism ends up with is two redemptive plans. One for the, for the nation of Israel, and one for the Gentiles during the church age. So we've talked about, I'm going to skip. Uh, so, um, actually, we'll get to that. Let me do it. Um, how, um, for dispensationalism, uh, God is dealing with Israel in the Old Testament. Um, and there's five or six dispensations which we'll look at. And then uh, an unexpected thing happens, the Jews reject Jesus. Jesus came to be the Jesus, Jewish Messiah. Um, but uh, the Israel does not accept Jesus. And so you have this break, right? Um, which is sometimes called the great parentheses. God's whole business in the Old Testament has been to establish Israel. Uh, and now God uh, embarks on a new, different thing that is not really reflected in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is about God's promises to Israel. But now there's this church age um, in which Gentiles come in and are welcomed in through the preaching of the cross. Um, this church age ends with the rapture. All those people on the airplane uh, that left were Christians. Everybody else that's left um, are non-believers and or Jews in Israel, Israelites, right? Um, and because all of the Christians, uh, Jesus makes a halfway descent. Uh, 
hanging around, taxiing in the clouds, and all of the Christians are, are swept out of the earth, and then history continues, right? There's a seven-year period of tribulation, and what God is doing here is returning to what his original plan was, and that is to convert the Jews, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and then uh, Jesus, there's this big battle. Uh, Jesus comes, and then there's a literal thousand-year period, uh, the millennium, a literal thousand years where Jesus reigns. Various things happen. Uh, and then... Um, there's another uh, climactic battle at the very end, and then the great white throne judgments. So this is very problematic. I mean, quite apart from you know the fact that that uh, that, that that God's redemptive purposes are are twofold is just is just a wrong way of reading scriptures, right? I mean, scripture is about Jesus first, second, last, right? Um, Anyway, questions or comments about that? Um, if you take all the good people and put them in heaven, why would you care what goes on on earth? Because he wants to convert Israel. I guess. You just let them eat each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, those converted during the tribulation, including Jews, 144,000. Again, that's a literal number. Um, uh, going to the millennium to repopulate the earth, remember how many ever billion Christians have left. Um, and glorified believers rule with Christ during his future reign. I don't, um, the millennium, during those thousand years, there's a return to Old Testament temple worship. The temple is rebuilt um, uh, and animal sacrifice. Um, at the end of the millennium, there is a judgment, great white throne judgment. Satan, all of the unbelievers, cast in the lake of fire in the heaven of the earth. Do you happen to know what they think? What about all the Jews, though, that have lived between Christ in I that time? Are they all have rejected lived when? then? When? when? Between Christ's time and then this. During the age of the church. Mm -hmm. During the age of the church. I don't know. Because you could say, right, that the Jews before Christ were looking forward to Christ, right. and many of them were maybe are, are saved. But then, if Christ has, has been here, what's happened to all those, why, why are those Jews that are alive sort of given another chance? But obviously yeah. the Jews that are dead after Christ, I guess, aren't given the same chance. Yeah. So I'm just curious. I would, I wonder I'll say the, 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 the smartest thing I ever say about that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every few years, you know, I end up teaching something like this, and you know, every ten years or something. Yeah. So I dive into this, and then I completely put it out of my mind for the next ten years. So <laughs> I, I don't know. So here's a here's a, basically what I just said: um, Church Age, the secret return of Christ, the Rapture, seven year tribulation, Armageddon, uh, the visible return of Christ. To rule on earth. I don't know if she can go to judgment. They put these things up. Uh, the thousand years, then that little period. This is the great white throne judgment, which is a passage in, excuse me, Revelation 20 or 20, I don't know, near the end. You have a new earth. Um, so uh, here is, uh, I summarized, took this from. That CTCR document that I, 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 I passed around it was produced in the 1980s, I think. Um, which is a very good document for uh, studying eschatology and um, this, evaluating this movement. So, dispens number one, dispensational premillennialism teaches that the Messiah and his kingdom promised in the Old Testament are essentially political in nature. So, again, this is kind of reviewing what I've already said. Um, but again, the focus of the entire Bible ends up being this physical kingdom in Israel. And this is why, by the way, in light of uh, events in the Middle East just recently, um, this is why for evangelicals and those who are tied up into dispensational premillennialism, um, this uh, 
the working out of the prophecies and uh, the coming of Christ and Armageddon and all of that is all focused on the Middle East and on God's uh, purposes in Israel. And so you get this thing where evangelicals, some evangelicals, are very, very, in the political sphere, uh, supportive of the nation of Israel uh, at all costs, right? Because they feel like uh, God is uh, in favor of or behind the nation of Israel. Their stance is, on the one hand, if, uh, you know, and can be uh, an American political stance. In other words, you and I, we, we could can be totally supportive of Israel in any circumstance, not just now, but any time. And, and we can make that decision as that's in America's best interest. Or I feel like Israel has the high moral ground in the Middle East and it would be better for the people there, um, blah, 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 blah. There could be a lot of reasons why we support Israel. It's not a valid reason, in my opinion, that biblical prophecy says, you know, that uh, Israel is, you know, uh, God's chosen and are going to be a part of this prophetic scheme. And so uh, Christians have to support Israel um, because the Bible says so and we have to support prophecy and all the rest. That's not a valid reason. But that is a motivation uh, for, for much of the evangelical. A support of Israel. So that's a distinction that to be made. We can be, if we want to, full-throated defenders of Israel, um, but that's not a theological position. It's not a scriptural position. People in Israel are brought to salvation in the same way uh, that Gentiles are, and that is by believing in Christ. God does not have a separate plan for Israel. They, they are special to him uh, because they are his people that he chose, but salvation comes through Christ. And so the church has no business uh, promoting some sort of political support for Israel on, on the basis of the Bible, on the scripture. It's just, that's just not. Hey, that's my speech. <laughs> <clears throat> In Jerusalem today, there's actually a, a group that is rebuilding all of the things for the temple. Right. So then I, I think a lot of evangelicals are contributing to that because they, they believe that's going to happen. Yes. Right, and, and this I should have put as another um, step in the popularization of this teaching is that uh, the nation of Israel was reestablished. Um, well, we shouldn't even say reestablished because the current state of the, of the, the current state of modern Israel has almost nothing to do with the the, the uh, state of Israel in the New Testament times, you know, zero. I mean, there's certainly descendants physically from those people 2,000 years ago, but the circumstances surrounding the, the establishment of the Jewish state following World War II have, have nothing to do with the Bible or with history of Palestine in that time. So one of the things that heated this up, and again, made this, made this scheme uh, popular is, is the fact that Israel was reestablished as a nation, um, which was interpreted by many as a step or a part of you know, this whole working out of the, um, the second coming of Christ and this big battle of Armageddon uh, and, and so forth. And, and in connection with that, you know, any step towards rebuilding the temple in Israel is also felt to be a part of biblical prophecy. They could rebuild the temple tomorrow and it would have no effect, and it would mean nothing, biblically speaking. Right? Uh, because why? Because the Bible says Jesus is the temple. Right? Jesus is the temple. Uh, he is the cornerstone, uh, the temple, we can go through the, the passages. What happened, I mean, now I'm really going to get a question. Yeah. About what? Two things. I have two things. I have one is a comment that is only because we called this out in chapel last week, is in Psalm 118, the stone, the, you know, it, it predicts that the stone's going to be rejected, that Christ right. is going to be rejected by Israel, right? That, and then the, the second part is that um, if they, I guess in theory, if the temple is rebuilt, that would mean the, the religious people of Israel would resume sacrifices. 
I don't know. I don't know. Because that's why they're not doing them now, is because there's no threat. Right, right, right. right. Do the live animal sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, I assume so. That's what the temple was there right. for. Right. Yes. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, in some of those movies, they have a red heifer coming back to Israel. Well. Yeah, yeah well, but, but I'm going back, gets back to your point, is if they go back to animal sacrifice, Jesus already right. did right. sacrifice, so the temple being rebuilt really has right. no, no so, press. Right. So the physical place of Palestine, Israel, Canaan, all those places are, are very special, um, but they, um, they have no significance, no eternal significance, no redemptive significance, no prophetic significance anymore for Christians. I mean, we can go there, we can thankful to God, we can worship in those places. Christians have always marked those places with Christian place houses of worship. So uh, Calvary, uh, Bethlehem, the temple, all of those places have been marked since very early, the 300s, by uh, small houses of worship and then larger cathedrals. Um, but this is marking Christ in those places and what God did, right? But, and so the physical place of the of, of Israel has no significance whatsoever yeah. uh, in God's plan. Christ does. Christ is the promised land. Christ is all those things. Um, just like, well, never mind. Um, uh, dispensational premillennialism regards the messianic age as only future, depriving people of the comforting promises of the gospel in the present. Right. So. Christ is king now. Uh, we are members of his kingdom now. Uh, we are already reigning in heaven, as we've talked about. Um, his kingdom is already established. Um, there is no, there, there's a future fulfillment. It's certainly not an earthly fulfillment other than the new heaven and new earth. Um, this scheme tends to push everything off into the, into the future. Right. And so you become... You know, the more you get into this, the more you're talking about prophecies and what's going to happen. And, and the present is just a template or a, 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 to be to see how close are we or what's happening to make Jesus come back. Uh, and so everything in the now uh, becomes interpreted or becomes fodder for, you know, the, the end times. Right? Uh, regards the glory of God as the center of theology. Uh, the visible manifestations of God's power at the end and obedience to his will become the focus. Uh, this is true of Calvinism and Reformed theology in general. Um, again, it's, it, what happens is if once you move Christ off the center, then uh, other things, primarily the glory of God, his power, tend to go into the middle. And this, in this system, is manifested as this political thing. Right? His, his power on earth. Rather, the center is the mercy of God in the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross for the sins of the world. Um, that's where we find God. We don't find God in the Middle East. We find God in the, in the cross. We don't find God walking in the sea either. No. Uh, ignores biblical typology. All prophecy points to Jesus Christ as the fulfillment. He is the antitype of the Old Testament types. It's a weird way of talking, which we don't talk about, talk that way a lot, but the traditional way of understanding the scripture is the Old Testament was um, were types or shadows uh, or prefiguring, not specifically prophecies, but um, so that, say, the animal sacrifices were types um, or pictures, we could say, or um, prefiguring of Christ on the cross. So the Old Testament sacrifice is the um, um, is the type, and Jesus is the fulfillment. And so all of the Old Testament, and we're going to talk about Jonah, right? Jonah is a type of Christ. Uh, Jonah was swallowed by the uh, fish uh, three days, three nights vomited up, death and resurrection. And so that picture that Jonah presents points to and is fulfilled in Christ. Uh, and so all Old Testament things, everything, but 
in general, that's the movement, right? And again, as we've said over and over, uh, this scheme uh, takes all of that Old Testament stuff, lifts it over Jesus, and plops it down here in the future. Right. Um, it takes an end run around the cross. Um, the compartmentalization of Scripture into distinct dispensation overlooks the unity of the Old and the New Testaments. And again, here's what we were just talking about. The relationship between the Old and the New Testament is one of promise and fulfillment. And I may have skipped. Um, Here is the, here are the dispensations. We talked about this, but I could never. Find. But here are the seven, right? Where God works in each age, each time period, in a different way, with a different principle at work and a different goal, right? So in the Garden of Eden it is the age of innocence, right? And the focus is. I don't know, preserving Adam and Eve's innocence. Then conscience, Adam and Eve's family. Again, we're only to Genesis 6 here. Um, human government over Noah in Noah, Genesis 9 through 11. That's before the Tower of Babel. Um, then, uh, well, up through the Tower of Babel. Then the age of promise, or the dispensation of promise to Abraham, uh, Genesis 12 through Exodus 19. This is the giving of the law in Exodus 20. Um, and this is the entire period of uh, the beginning of the nation of Israel, all the way through the Exodus um, into Sinai in the wilderness. Once the giving of the law comes, um, the God is now uh, testing people on and looking for the obedience under the principle of the law. The law that was given to Moses. The Jews, so this goes all the way to Acts chapter 2, um, which is Pentecost. Uh, the Jews reject Jesus, right? So then we go into this church age uh, in which God is now trying to bring in Gentiles. Uh, but he hasn't given up on Israel, he's just doing something different, right? Then you have uh, um, the, the tribulation period, rapture, tribulation, seven years. And then you move into this thousand-year period, which is the seventh dispensation. And, you know, this is sort of the classic thing, but um, spent 200 years, and, and different people have different ways of slicing this up. Um, and so you'll get slightly different, um, you know, setups for this. Uh, this is the same thing. I don't know why I put it to this more complicated stuff at the bottom. But that's the basic idea. Um, now I'm confused. I don't know why I'm here. Where is it? This is an interesting um, comment, right? Dispensationalism offers a dangerously false hope that Christians are exempted from intensified persecution towards the end. So the rapture. Right, Christians don't experience uh, the tribulation uh, or the tribulations. They are, you know, they take the elevator up into the clouds, and all of the bad stuff is going on. When you read the New Testament, um, it's clear that Christian, the Christian life, is precisely one of tribulation and suffering, holding on to God's promises, persevering, running the race, endurance, um, and this kind of. Um, again, I don't think that these teachers would necessarily argue with that, but the way things are set up, you know, all of your attention is, is directed towards this tribulation period and the millennium, and so um, all the bad stuff is going to happen in the future, and the, the hope for Christians is you get raptured, right? And, and you, don't have to, you don't have to deal with it. Dr. Pastor? Yeah. That being said... I don't want to conflate too much or have a grand delusion question, but I get really confused on some of this stuff. Well, so do I, Jay. <laughs> All right, it's like three points. Now, I know in one of the earlier charts, and 
even in the movie clip that talked about the Antichrist. Yeah. Is there any equivalent Antichrist in amillennialism versus dispensational premillennialism? Because right, yeah, we were technically in the tribulation. And there's is there a literal Antichrist in I'll call it GP just to make it easy. They're, they're saying there's a literal Antichrist. Is there one in amillennialism? Well, Jay, last week <laughs> if I've been here, <laughs> yes, we did talk about uh, uh, what uh, sort of a straightforward uh, you know, class on what the traditional teaching is. And yes, the answer is yes. First of all, did DP just it's just, just like saying the word. <laughs> Uh, I try to uh, uh, abbreviate it, but not spending more time. Dispensational premillennialism teaches, yes, there's a little anti antichrist. And he was that swarmy little guy on the, uh, you know, it, this ties in with this teaching about one world government. Right. And the suspicion of the UN and all, all that sort of thing. Um, from a theologian, you can be suspicious of it politically, that's fine. But then there's this this teaching, supposedly in the scripture, one world government antichrist. So yes, dispensational premillennialism. And yes... The traditional amillennial Lutheran teaching, traditional teaching, yes, there is an antichrist. The Bible talks about antichrists um, with a plural, small a, is taught. The spirit of the antichrist, which is has been around since the moment the church started, okay. right? And and, and the, the epistles of Saint John are written in large part to combat that. Paul talks about that sort of thing, and uh, there is a singular antichrist, and uh, Paul talks about him in Second Thessalonians, the man of rebellion, the lawless one, and and John's epistles picture him as named the antichrist, and the Book of Revelation in various ways, confusing ways, also teaches him. Okay. So the answer to the yes, and this is, um, you know, the the traditional. Uh, outline is is that there's going to be this little season at the very end, right? I mean, we are in the church age now. We are living through the millennium. Uh, there's Jesus' death, his ascension, he sends the Spirit. Uh, and this is the thousand years. Mm -hmm. And then there's a small period, not defined by how long, because we don't know, right before Jesus' return, it's called the little season. And during, in that period, then, then Christ appears, um, and there's intense signs and wonders and so forth. Okay. Uh, geography. Yeah, that's the next topic. Uh, you know, for years and especially now, I keep hearing about Palestine. Now, I know mm -hmm. by you know Roman times that it's Palestine. There was something called Syria dash Palestine. I keep hearing people talking about you know the Palestinians going to Palestine. Now, there is no geographical area of Palestine, or is there? I, well, that's not a is. Uh, I'll show you the smartest thing I'm gonna say all day. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's more so. I mean, I, I don't. I'm not gonna argue with somebody about Palestine. I think there is something called Palestine. You know what what that exactly entails, and what you know just depends on what people have understood over the centuries. What was Palestine in Jesus' time versus what is Palestine now? I mean, there's been two thousand years of history. Um, so yeah, I think there is a general area which we would generally agree is Israel's. You know, I don't know what Palestine is exactly. We could probably Google it. Uh, um, so I don't know what's behind your question, really. Oh well, it just I, I guess well, we've heard the word Palestine a few times. I'm just confused though. Right. It seems like today they're called Gaza and the West Bank is referred to as Palestine. Mm -hmm. I've heard many references to. Right. Jay, I think it's helpful to, at least for me, to think about it is Israel came and took back what they thought was their land. There were other people in those lands that they pushed into the West Bank and into Gaza and said, that's the part you get. And we happened to name them Palestinians. Palestine. Okay, so I, I wouldn't think of Palestine as quote, a place. There are people, they're Palestinians, right? right? They got pushed out of a geographical region. Now, I don't know, and we could Google it or we could even yeah. chat GPT and find out, but, but I think I think it's more it, right. it, so, it's more like Israel came back and said, we want the land that, quote, God gave us, yeah. <laughs> and there were people there, and they pushed those people out. 
I think that this period, this so here's the Jordan, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Sea of, Ga sea of Galilee, Dead Sea. Um, and so this, I don't know where the exact borders are. I mean, you have Syria up here. Right. Um, Egypt begins yeah. somewhere down here. I'm not good at this. Okay. But this general area, you know, remember, there was no Jewish state from AD 70 when the Romans destroyed it until 1947 or 48 when the UN... Uh, and what the UN said was that there was to be a, a, a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. This, this area was just called Palestine for 2,000 years. And, and Jews lived there. I mean, there were always smatterings of se uh, settlements. There was, uh, and it would ebb and flow. And in the, you know, in the, hundred, in the 1800s and early 1900s, Zionism uh, was on the upswing, right? And there were more and more Jewish settlements, especially in the 1900s. Uh, and then the Holocaust, and anyway, so this whole area was called Palestine. The people who lived there, there's not uh, as much, and then there's Jordan, there's Syria, and these people didn't have, and again, I'm, I'm really shaky ground, and somebody can, can correct me, my knowledge is shaky. There was not a sense of a, was a central national government. thing, and they were also under uh, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, or whatever that was called, I can't remember. Uh, uh, maybe it was called the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and then World War One kind of destroyed that empire. Uh, Britain also used Palestine was a colony. Oh, the British maybe. Palestine of the British Empire, and so there was no real national as defined as Egypt and as Syria and as Jordan was, and so they were simply the people who lived in Palestine. They were Palestinians, and they didn't really have a state that I know of. I could be wrong about. And then, as, as Stan said, in 1947, the Jewish state was uh, carved out. Um, and then the history, right, if I know it just better than me. Even the Lutheran Witness, which I, well, even the Lutheran Witness magazine referred to, uh, at least referencing back, with Syria, Palestine. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent, but I, right. I, it's, just, it, it's, it, it's become a talking point since current events have come up. Yeah, sure. I've never been. Yeah. It seems to it's confused a little bit. Uh, right. I, well, I don't know that I uh, provided any clarity, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, you could you could compare it to somewhat to the United States, as there were Indians living here, and we came yeah. here and we pushed the Indians off their reservations, right? You know, so it was just what yeah. happens in life, and <laughs> it's the way of the world. Unfortunately, right. <laughs> and, and those again, my point theologically, scripturally. Right is those events have nothing to do with biblical prophecy. Right. They may indeed have something to do with a Christian way of looking at the world and a way of doing having justice, you know, and, and we as Christians may disagree. We may disagree about what's an equitable solution to that problem. You and I can disagree about that because the Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible does not have a plan for, the, for Israel and Palestine. It does not. It has a plan about Jesus. And so you and I can disagree about our political approach to the, to the Middle East, right? Um, just like we can disagree about how much federal taxes should be or any number of things. Um, so, uh, the dispensational view of, is of a radical break between Israel and the church contradicts scripture, cross of Christ has taken away the division between Jew and Gentile. I think this is important. In New Testament speaking, the church is Israel. So when we pray the Psalms now, right, uh, and, and it talks about uh, Judah, and it talks about Israel, and it talks about the king, and it talks about the temple, and the throne, and the kingdom. When we pray all those Psalms, we're praying our, those are our Psalms, and we are not praying about Israel, the physical Israel. We are praying about our salvation. We are praying Jesus, right? And so Romans 9, we could do a long time on Romans 9. Uh, eventually Paul says all Israel will be saved. So this is also a part of dispensational theology. But what's important here, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So not all of the physical descendants of Abraham belong to Israel, right? 
and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. So twice here, Paul said the same thing in two different ways. Not who all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all who are children of Abraham physically. Not all are children of Abraham. This is spiritual children of Abraham. Not everybody is a part of spiritual Israel just because they are physical offspring of Abraham. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Isaac is the child of promise, right? This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. So being a descendant of Abraham does not mean that you are automatically part of Israel. Israel, Paul is saying, and we can look at all of chapter 9 at that time, Israel equals those who have faith in Christ, whether you are a, whether you are a descendant of Abraham or not. Right? The, that's what, right? Um, and when Paul says in the book of Romans, all Israel will be saved, almost certainly he is talking about everyone who has faith. When he says all Israel shall be saved, he means everybody who believes in Jesus. Because Israel is, are uh, uh, those who believe. There are no outstanding problems. Again, I'll make a broken record. Uh, not. There are no uh, outstanding promises to the state of Israel. Uh, they were all fulfilled in Christ. All right, I'm about out of time. Uh, we're not going to talk about postmillennialism, <laughs> uh, although it's much simpler. Um, any questions or comments? Just a final thing. Um, uh, this is how the Bible ends um, in the book of Revelation. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. So this was Paul John's prayer, the Apostle John, in the year 90 or whenever he wrote this, uh, that Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. And the church's response is, come, Lord Jesus. And so it's the same for us. Jesus is coming soon. There's no doubt about that. And we pray, come, Lord Jesus. Next week, Jonah. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>